Thanks to all the supporters for uh, supporting the Mises Institute, uh, and especially some of you uh, who've been here for years and years. Uh, and uh, I, I've been around also for years and years at the Mises Institute for more than 20, I think. And uh, I can remember this meeting, you know, the October meeting in the early days where we had about the same 20 or 22, 23 people uh, every, every, uh, every October. And uh, it's, it's grown quite a bit. And so uh, the, the title I gave, uh, as, as Doug said, is um, uh, uh, How and Why Washington Lies About Everything. And when, when they asked me to give a talk on a, a conference on uh, uh, Washington's big lie, uh, it's, it was like, perfect for me because I, back in uh, 1992, uh, my co-author James Bennett and I wrote this book, Official Lies, How Washington Misleads Us. And, uh, and so uh, I know a thing or two about government lying. Of course, you could write a book that would fill all of the bookshelf space here at the Mises Institute on, on government lies. But, uh, and so I'm not going to go over and you know, repeat a thousand government lies for you. But I thought I'd start by um, mentioning a few statements that government has made. And maybe you can tell me whether you think it's a truth or a lie. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, here's, here's one. Uh, Every vote counts. How does that sound? That's, that's, uh, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Uh, how about that one? Uh, the history buffs in the audience might know that one of the first things the federal government did was to outlaw free speech with the Sedition Act. Uh, you know, as soon as George Washington left town, uh, that's exactly what they did. Uh, let's see, what else do I have here? The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's a lie, isn't it? What, what city doesn't have a, a gun control law? Uh, let's see, the next one is, we are winning the war on drugs. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a, that's a And then, there, then there's, the Constitution applies in good times and in bad times. <laughs> applies to what, they don't say, but, uh, it didn't, but uh, uh, let's see. Your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars. Uh, we don't torture. That's a, that's a more recent one. And then Abraham Lincoln was a great humanitarian. That's another, that's another one that, that's in there. And so, uh, so those are just a few off the top of my head of the things that, you know, that I think about. And um, uh, Joseph Schumpeter, whose picture is up here, Peter had Joseph Schumpeter's picture up here. He wrote about this in his famous book, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. And uh, there's a, this is a widely uh, quoted uh, a phrase about, about why it is that uh, uh, government is able to get away with uh, lying so much about so many things. And it's kind of a nice turn of phrase, so I thought I'd quote him. And, uh, and he said, the picture of the prettiest girl that ever lived will in the long run prove powerless to maintain the sales of a bad cigarette. There is no equally effective safeguard, however, in the case of political decisions. Many decisions of fateful importance are of a nature that makes it impossible for the public to experiment with them at its leisure and at moderate cost. Even if that is possible, however, judgment is as a rule not so easy to arrive at as it is in the case of the cigarette because the effects are less easy to interpret. That's a little bit long-winded, but it's a good point if you compare you know, private advertising in the market to what the government does, and you could call it advertising, I guess, self-promotion and advertising, there, there are these fundamental, very fundamental differences in, in the incentive system there. And uh, I wrote an article about this. Uh, it was in the Baltimore Sun about a month ago, and it was reprinted on lourockwell.com. Uh, it's sort of related to this point. And it was uh, the title the Sun gave it uh, was kind of a very clunky title. It was uh, uh, Business Ethics Wrong Focus. And I don't know, it's kind of clunky. But uh, the point of the article was, uh, uh, for years I've been annoyed at universities who teach business ethics, and especially mine, my university. They, at the time, like right now, they're running ads on the radio in Baltimore uh, that say, uh, 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 learn a different way of doing business. That is, that they assume if you're in business, you're by definition immoral. So come and, and be lectured to by one of our left-wing lawyers. 
and, and we will make you a moral person. They don't literally say that, but that's what would happen if you were a business person in Baltimore and you signed up for the MBA program at my university uh, on the basis of, well, you want to learn about business ethics. They, they literally have lawyers and only lawyers who teach about ethics. And I've always thought that was hilarious, <laughs> that, that the lawyers and only lawyers teach you about, about ethics. I mean, uh, but, but that's what they do. But, but the point I made was that, you know, really a really simple point. You know, if you're, if you're a liar in business, uh, well, there's a penalty to be paid. There's a market feedback mechanism. Uh, consumers will catch on if you defraud them. You won't get repeat customers. Suppliers are not going to want to do business with you. Your competitors will have every incentive to point out your lies or your fraud. Uh, you, you may be sued and so forth. And that doesn't guarantee uh, honesty, but it sure provides a reward for honesty uh, in terms of customer loyalty and, uh, and, and, and profits. And I had one of the guest speakers I had at a lecture series at my university was uh, Rabbi Daniel Lappin, who was here, uh, I think two years ago, he gave, he gave a talk, or a year and a half ago. And uh, one of the points he made in this, in this talk was, uh, in his research, he went on a tour of, of the South conducting research on, on Jewish businesses uh, that have been around for generations. And, uh, and what Rabbi Lappin found is that he found all these examples of uh, communities all throughout the South where for generations there have been close relationships between the local merchant and the community. Uh, they, they all know each other personally, they're friends. And, and the, the main point he made in talking to this group of students is that, well, how could that exist if they're cheating and defrauding these people, you know, year in, year out, generation in, generation out? Well, it, well, it couldn't. Uh, you know, it's, it's not the nature of, of uh, competitive capitalism that, that you get cheated. But it seems to me that, and so the point of my article in the Baltimore Sun was that if you want to teach people about ethical problems in society. Well, government is where the real big problems are. You know, it's like, it's like thinking, well, there's a fly on the carpet here, and that's a problem. But whereas there's a dinosaur out there, a Tyrannosaurus Rex, you know, charging toward this room. Let's ignore that. That's, not, that's, nothing, to worry. that's nothing to worry about. Let's get the fly. And so that's basically the point I made. And uh, uh, maybe later during cocktails, I'll tell you about some of the hilarious uh, email, hate mail I got from uh, some of the local commies in, in Baltimore about this. Uh, <laughs> this uh, including the county executive in Baltimore County, who's a, a big lefty and and uh, accused me of uh, defending the salmonella outbreak in eggs that, that was in the news a couple of weeks ago. But, but the incentives are totally different. In, in government, uh, there is no market feedback mechanism that penalizes you for being a liar. In fact, uh, uh, Murray Rothbard, in one of his articles, his article on just war, uh, uh, he... Uh, he mentioned Abe Lincoln, and he said, uh, you know, historians all call Abe Lincoln a master politician, and he was. He was, I, I, I tell people he was Bill Clinton times 10,000 in terms of being a slippery politician, but uh, Murray's definition of a master politician is a masterful liar, conniver, and manipulator. And, and so, and that's the way the system is. That's what gets rewarded in, in politics, uh, I would argue, because the government gives itself a, a tremendous uh, a degree of autonomy compared to businesses who constantly have to, to strive to, uh, to please their customers. And, and here's an example of um, the, what, what businesses do to give themselves this, uh, or not business, the government, to give itself this autonomy. I don't know if uh, the people in the back can see this, but what this is, is uh, uh, some, a, a bar chart of re-election rates over the years of the U.S. House of Representatives. Then I'm going to show you the Senate. I don't think I can get them. Let's see if I can get them both up here. Over the years, it begins in 1964 and ends in uh, 2008. And if you look at the House of Representatives, the average is about, it looks to be about 97%. Uh, even in 1994, the Republican Revolution year, there was still 84% the re-election rate in the, in, the, in the House of Representatives. In the Senate, there's a little more variation in the Senate, but uh, the average still looks to be around 80 to 85% in, in the Senate. And so the, with gerrymandering and huge staffs, which are essentially taxpayer financed ca campaign staffs, uh, the Congress has rigged the system so that almost uh, nothing can unseat them. Barney Frank, for goodness sake, is still in the Congress. And uh, uh, when I uh, lived in the D.C. area years ago and I re would read the Washington Post, I think it's been 15, maybe 20 years now. Uh, I can't remember exactly when. 
but Barney got caught, uh, his, his uh, boyfriend was running a, a prostitution ring out of the basement of their house. And it was on the front page of the Washington Post for a whole week. And of course, nothing happened to him other than he's been reelected 10 times <laughs> since that. So you can, I mean, you know, would you uh, not end up in jail if you were running a prostitution ring in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in your town? Don't answer that. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but, 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 so you can get away with almost anything. Uh, well, I grew up in Pennsylvania, and there was this uh, politician there, a congressman named Flood, and he looked just like Snidely Whiplash in the Bullwinkle cartoons. He had a handlebar mustache, he wore a big fedora hat, and a cape, a black cape. I'm not making this up. I could probably find him on Google and find Congressman Flood. And he was convicted of a, of a felony, but I guess the Pennsylvania electoral system, he appealed, and I think the electoral system, the laws said if if it's under appeal, he can still run for re-election. And then if he loses the appeal, then he goes, he goes, you know, he can't be a congressman. But he was re-elected. And at the time, uh, I was a teenager at the time, I, can, I still remember this in the newspaper. They asked people, why did you vote for Congressman Flood? Everyone knows he's a crook. And the general answer was, well, yes, they're all crooks, but he's a pretty good crook that brings back a lot of uh, pork to our, to our district for road building projects and all that. So, so we like him for that reason. So you can even be a felon, of course, and, uh, and, and a lot of people have no problem as long as you keep uh, uh, you know, bringing, back, bringing home the bacon, as they, as they call it. And so uh, because the, the system is so rigged like this, uh, there's so much autonomy, uh, you, you can get away with lying. There's no penal, penalty for lying. And on top of that, there's the economic principle that's known as rational ignorance, that people are rationally ignorant. That is, most of us spend most of our time educating ourselves on how to do our job, how to raise our families, and, and so forth. And, uh, and, and you don't really spend that much time in, uh, educating yourself on social policy. In fact, uh, when I talk about this to college students, I bring up on the computer uh, in the classroom uh, the alphabetical listing of federal agencies. If you just Google that, you know, there's a big long list. And if you just pick one or two of them out, there'll be a brief description of what it does. And it sounds like, you know, it's hieroglyphics. You know, you, you, so no human mind could possibly understand you know, a, a tiny, tiny percentage of 1% of what the government does, and therefore we're all rationally ignorant. And that enables the government to get away with uh, uh, a lot of this uh, misinformation that it, um, that it uh, spreads uh, to us. And another point about uh, government and information or misinformation is, you know, the purpose of advertising, real advertising, is it's competition. It's a way of competing, uh, advertising. But government is usually a monopoly in things it does. So you have to ask yourself, why does government advertise if it's a monopoly? Uh, well, the only uh, logical explanation, I think, is just to, to get the public to acquiesce in, in whatever it's doing, uh, you know, not to, uh, not to uh, compete because it doesn't compete. It doesn't have to compete. Um, and of course, uh, one other point before I give you some examples uh, is, uh, you know, debt and inflation are the, the, the best tools the government has for hiding and uh, lying to us about the true cost of government, not just the cost of wars, but the cost of uh, government in general uh, when it, when it uh, p finances them with debt and inflation. And so, and so these are just some comments on how the government goes about lying to us and, uh, uh, maybe I should, I should give uh, John Kenneth Galbraith a good kick in the butt here while I have a chance. And he wrote, uh, uh, Galbraith's whole career was based on telling the same story over and over again. Basically, he wrote several books that basically say the same thing, that, uh, that advertising uh, dupes us into spending too much of our money on things that we don't really need. And, and therefore, the government should tax us more because we're wasting our money on things that we want, and we should build uh, more things that John Kenneth Galbraith uh, wants, like statues of him in Cambridge, Massachusetts, or something like that, <laughs> that the government should put up. He spent his whole life uh, doing that, and a lot of Americans st still believe this. To, to the extent that Americans have uh, any economic knowledge, or they think they have economic knowledge, uh, a lot of them are Galbraithians. Whether they've read his books or not, they were taught this in school at some point, and they had this idea. Friedrich Hayek debunked this, though, uh, in a famous article called The Non Sequitur of the Dependence Effect. It was in the Southern Economic Journal around 1960. And Galbraith's uh, uh, famous slogan was that uh, because, of, because of all this advertising, uh, that we have a 
private affluence amidst public squalor. That is, the, the, the government sector is in squalor. It's, it's, it's just so small, but we have affluence everywhere, and, and we're all just too stingy, and we don't give the government enough of our money. And, and so and that's, that was always the, the, ba the basis of it. And, uh, but the basis of his argument was that only the innate wants are worthwhile. The ones that are innate within our own minds are worthwhile and worth spending our money on, and not the ones that are brought to our attention. And in short, Hayek uh, responded by saying, well, food, shelter, and sex are probably the only innate wants. Everything else is brought to our attention by somebody else, including the books of John Kenneth Galbraith. <laughs> and so, so if, if only the innate wants are worth anything, that would mean the Bible is worthless, Shakespeare is worthless, and as I said, the books of John Kenneth Galbraith are worthless. So, but Galbraith, of course, got it all backwards. Uh, you know, it's government propaganda and lying and advertising, if you want to call it that, that creates the imbalance in terms of a, you know, a government that is much too big, much bigger than it would be if the citizens had more accurate information about what the government is up to. And uh, so, so now I'm gonna give a few, few examples in the rest of my time. Uh, you know, as I said, Jim Bennett and I wrote a whole book about this years ago, but uh, here's something I thought this group would, would, uh, would like. I did a little research on uh, how, how prohibition came about in the 1920s. What, you know, what was the crusade for prohibition? Who was for it? What did they say? And one of the things I ran across is that the Women's Christian Temperance Union had a department of scientific temperance, and they got all the public schools in the country to, to teach students about alcohol consumption. And so this was a government program. This is, what's, this is before prohibition. This was sort of laying the groundwork for prohibition. So I thought I'd read to you these things, and, and, uh, and maybe some of you are medical professionals, and you can tell us whether these are truth or, uh, or lies. Uh, the majority of beer drinkers die from dropsy. <laughs> uh, when alcohol passes down the throat, it burns off skin, leaving it bare and burning. Alcohol causes the heart to beat many unnecessary times. And, uh, and after the first dose, the heart is in danger of giving out so that it needs something to keep it up. And therefore, the person to whom the heart belongs to has to take drink after drink after drink to keep his heart going. Okay. Um, this, is all, this is taught to every public school child in America. Alcohol turns the blood to water. Um, and finally... An invalid man who never drinks liquor will get well, whereas a drinking man will surely die. And so I just thought that would be kind of a funny thing, to, you know, in terms of government lies. Um, another, another example of a, a classic example of government lying is, you probably can't see this, the letters are too small. Yeah, that's too small for anybody. But... Um, you know, the oil industry in America was invented uh, about, uh, about the time of, uh, when John, right after the Civil War. John D. Rockefeller founded Standard Oil Company in 1866. And as soon as he did that, the government began predicting that we're going to run out of oil at any minute, <laughs> and, and, and unless, unless the government takes over. And so let, let me give you a few examples. I have a, a chart here that I'll read from. The 1866. The U.S. Uh, Revenue Commission said synthetics will be available if oil production ends. So they were already, the, the year John D. Rockefeller founded Standard Oil, they were predicting the end to oil. In 1885, the U.S. Ge Geological Survey said there's little or no chance of finding oil in California, uh, but then 8 billion uh, barrels were pumped from, uh, from that date uh, uh, you know, to the present. Uh, then in 1891, the Geological Survey said, there's little or no chance of finding oil in Texas or Kansas. <laughs> now I'll move up to 1914, the U.S. Bureau of Mines. The uh, total future domestic production of oil is only 5.7 billion barrels, uh, but there have been sort of like 50 billion barrels uh, you know, since then, uh, as opposed to that. Uh, let's see... Uh, 1939, the U.S. Department of Interior said U.S. oil supplies will last only 13 more years. And so you see, I guess you get the picture of all these, these crazy uh, 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 
predictions. And of course, the purpose of this was always to try to make the case for a government takeover of energy industries, uh, because leaving it to the market, you were going to run out of everything, as far as that goes. Um, so that's my, my second example. Uh, another example that uh, Bennett and I wrote about was um, poverty statistics. Uh, you know, the st statistics that come out of government are kind of blinding, and, and some of the people at this uh, conference have talked about uh, 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 statistics. Uh, but in the poverty statistics, there's, there's an economist named Edgar Browning who gave a, a presidential address to the Southern Economic Association uh, some years ago, and he did a lot of research on uh, the, uh, the effects of the welfare state and, uh, and the economics of poverty over the course of his career, and published a lot of good articles on it. Uh, and uh, and he, he took a look at these claims that, um, that the government has, was making at the time that, uh, quote, the top 20% of income earners receive 44% of total income as though that's a bad thing necessarily. I guess they're supposed to receive exactly 20% of the t total income. But uh, the, when the government makes pronouncements like this and then and says, therefore, we need a more progressive tax system to redistribute the wealth, uh, to quote Barack Obama, uh, they say uh, what they do is this is based on, at the time, was based on pre-tax income. So, uh, so they're looking at people who make, say, $100,000 a year but they don't subtract out the taxes they pay to, in order to exaggerate how much money they have, how, what their disposable income is. And at the same time, they don't count any of the in-kind benefits that the welfare recipients got. And in some places, at the time Browning was writing this, uh, in some places, people were getting twenty or thirty thousand dollars a year worth of in-kind benefits, daycare allowances, and and uh, you know that that sort of thing. And so they they intentionally just skew the statistics uh, that way. Uh, on farming, uh, we, had, we had a chapter in this book on, uh, on uh, farming lies, and uh, one of the funnier ones was uh, the government declared, the government is always declaring that there are a lot more farmers than there actually are out there. And uh, for example, it said that there are 2.2 million farmers, but one million of these people denied that they were farmers. <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm not a farmer. You know, I have a garden in my backyard. You know, that's, I'm not a farmer. Uh, like one of the definitions was, that I think if you own uh, any kind of livestock, like a horse, you know, and I have friends who have like young children and they buy them a horse and they keep the horse at a stable somewhere. And on weekends, the girls go out and ride the horse. And, you know, so they're farmers because, because they own livestock. And so, and so whenever the next farm bill comes around, they want to be able to say, this is going to help 2.2 million uh, farmers, uh, not necessarily. Um, and of course, environmentalist propaganda, you could stand, I could stand up here for a month uh, repeating some of that. But, uh, and, but, I, but I would, if anybody is, uh, one of the best researchers we had in this area is the late Julian Simon. It was, it was a real loss for the whole freedom movement when Julian Simon passed away. But, uh, but he, he uh, was really uh, badgered the environmental movement and some of their claims. And there was a, a government report called the Global 2000 Report to the President that was a government-funded research project uh, that was supposed to look at all sorts of environmental issues and, 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 and inform the president and, and the Congress what all the problems are. And uh, Julian Simon got a hold of it and found that there was almost no data in there. They made all these... Uh, claims about, about uh, running out of resources, for example, without providing any uh, statistics on this. So, so, and, and Simon was a crackerjack statistician. And uh, I'll read you some of the things he came up with, um, just in general. Uh, Life expectancy growth rate will decline, says this report to the president. Uh, actually, the rate, Simon says, the rate is increasing at an increasing rate. Uh, Energy prices will increase. The long-term trend is for lower energy prices. Food availability will grow slowly. Simon says that uh, per capita food production have been growing twice as fast as projected. Uh, overpopulation is catastrophic, they, they, they said. And of course, Simon says, well, not necessarily. Look at Hong Kong. Uh, you know, why is it catastrophic there? Uh, it is if you don't have capitalism as your economic system, but uh, but not necessarily. And so uh, he looked at you know every one of these claims and debunked debunked them. And of course, Simon is famous for uh, his bet with the environmental uh, uh, hysteric uh, uh, Paul Ehrlich. 
he made him a bet. Uh, I think the way the bet went was uh, they said, Ehrlich, you pick any five minerals in the world and we'll bet us an amount of money that uh, every one, the price of every one of those minerals will be lower 10 years from now than it is. Uh, you know, betting that they will become more abundant in supply and the, and the increased supply will drop the price. And Ehrlich won the bet. And then he asked, uh, or not Ehrlich, uh, Simon did, uh, our guy won, won the bet. And then he asked uh, Paul Ehrlich if he would like to double the money and bet again, and he turned him down. Uh, but, but Paul Ehrlich is a celebrated entomologist. He's, a, he's trained in entomology, but he's one of the, uh, the authors of several famous books, The Limits to Growth was what is one of his. And, and it was all thoroughly debunked when it came out. And he keeps writing the same book essentially about every 10 years, claiming the whole world is uh, going to hell environmentally. I think he predicted there would be 25 million people left in America by 2000 in the 1960s. But he's still, you know, endowed shareholder at Stanford the last time I looked him up and, and that sort of thing. A um, uh, few more examples of government lying that are worth mentioning here. Well, the time I have, here's a good one. This is on the war on drugs. Uh, this is what uh, the government has, this is from a government uh, ad uh, in the early days of the war on drugs. Marijuana causes insanity. It incites, it incites its users to rape. Those who indulge in its habitual use eventually develop a delirious rage after its administration, during which time they are temporarily at least irresponsible and prone to commit violent crimes. Uh, well, I went to school in the, at a the, the time where you know, like half the student population were, were potheads, and they, they, they were the least violent people you would ever want to, want to see. <laughs> I never knew a violent pot. It was the beer drinkers who were the rowdy, the violent, the violent ones. And... Uh, but, uh, and this is one of a, a drug administration commissioner, I guess they call him commissioner, in, in the early days of the war on drugs. He's talking about opium and marijuana. He says, but here we have a drug that is not like opium. Opium has all the good of Dr. Jekyll and all the evil of Mr. Hyde. The, this drug, marijuana, is entirely the monster Hyde. So that's the sort of thing we, we got from the, the, the war in, in, in drugs. And then a uh, final thing that's related to the war on drugs. Uh, you know, the government publishes all sorts of reports on how good a job it's doing on the war on drugs. And, uh, and I always get a kind of a chuckle out of this because it claims to know with great precision down to the, the decimal points of the, 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 uh, the decline in drug use uh, that's out there. And you've got to wonder, how do they know how, how much illegal heroin use uh, is going on out there? They have they have their methods, but uh, but here's uh, you know for example there's one announcement we have reduced adolescent drug use by ten percent. How would they know that? Uh, uh, we reduced adolescent cocaine use by twenty percent from 1988 to 1999, and so you know again how would they know that? So they, they give these exact percentages, which is uh, really kind of kind of crazy as far as that goes, and. Yeah, that was uh, that was the best one I had had here. Uh, there's another uh, ad that the government put on TV about drugs about teenagers, and it said something like, "If your teenager is feeling lazy, grades are lower, they're depressed, then they're on drugs, and you better do something about it." <laughs> and so, as though teenagers never get depressed over losing a girlfriend or or, so, or get lazy, don't want to do their homework, but uh, but that's the war on drugs. And so uh, I think what I'll conclude with here is another quote from Schumpeter, Joseph Schumpeter, on the whole racket of uh, government propaganda and lying, where he said, uh, politicians are able to fashion and within very wide limits even to create the will of the people. What we are confronted with in the analysis of political processes is largely not a genuine but a manufactured will. So far as this is so, the will of the people is the product and not the motive power of the political process. The ways in which issues and the popular will on any issue are being manufactured is exactly analogous to the ways of commercial advertising. We find the same attempts to contact the subconscious, 
We find the same technique of creating favorable and unfavorable associations, which are more effective the less rational they are. We find the same evasions, the same trick of producing opinion by reiterated assertion that is successful precisely to the extent to which it avoids rational argument and the danger of awakening the critical faculties of the people. That's the last thing the government wants to do is to awaken the critical faculties of the people. That's, after all, that's what public school is for, isn't it? <laughs> to, to put those faculties asleep. And, uh, and of course, that is probably the biggest sin of government lies and propaganda is uh, running the public school system because that's where the lies and propaganda uh, come from. Uh, where else would everyone learn that Abe Lincoln was a great humanitarian, for example? And, uh, and that's about all I have time for. Uh, thank you.